summer psalms. Again, just doing select psalms in book five, and so we're jumping around uh, a little bit difficult for you to know exactly where I'm headed. Normally, as we're working through verse by verse, you can just kind of read ahead and, and know exactly where we're going, and, and you can kind of prepare yourself for what's coming. Uh, if we do these summer psalms, we're just, I've got a wide range to select. I'm just kind of reading through them all the time, and I'm so thankful for, certainly for the Word of God, uh, for how it meets us right where we're at. And that's certainly true for me uh, this week as I come to Psalm 115. Uh, been a great encouragement and challenge to my heart. And so uh, let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll, we'll dig into this uh, together this evening. Heavenly Father, I, I just want to stop and give thanks tonight. I want to thank you for, um, for who you are. That you are God and there is none else. The, the creator and sustainer of life. Uh, Lord, you're the one who has redeemed a people for yourself. Who's, who's brought us together uh, through Jesus Christ. Uh, it is your church. And Father, I, I, it's just a, a joy to gather with my brothers and sisters tonight. And my heart's been encouraged uh, through prayer. Father, I'm thankful not only for the ability to pray, and, and that is an overwhelming thing, to be able to come before the one who's able to do abundantly uh, beyond what we ask or think. And, uh, Lord, but I, I'm thankful for a people who pray. Uh, Lord, as we gather together to hear their heart and their concern for one another and for your work, and uh, Lord, for your kingdom uh, to advance, uh, not only here but around the world, and Lord, just a heart for your glory. Uh, Lord, it... Thank you. Thank you for your work in the hearts and lives of your people. I'm thankful for the, the many people who, who say week after week that they're praying. They're praying for their, their leaders. They're praying for their church family. And uh, Lord, that means so much. Uh, as we come and we bring our prayers before you, we know that you hear us and you answer according to your plans and purposes. And we find great comfort in that, knowing that you are on the throne and that you're in complete control. And Lord, as we... Uh, come together tonight. Lord, our hearts are with our, our teenagers who are at camp, and we ask that you would be with them, uh, Lord, that you would uh, prepare their hearts for what uh, they're, to, they're to receive uh, this week, and we ask, Father, that you would, um, you would challenge them, that you would change them, that you would mold them more to the image of Christ, and we look forward to, to hearing from them as they come home, and Lord, we certainly think of those who uh, are battling with sickness and Lord, we, we pray for Butch and Millie. We pray for Roy. And, and Lord, just the, the others who are mentioned, so many tonight. Uh, some who are here tonight but have been struggling. And, and Lord, we lift them up to you. And you know the needs. And uh, Lord, we pray for, uh, for our faith family here. Lord, we ask that you would guide and direct us, that you would help us to be exactly what you've called us to be. Lord, our heart's desire is the glory of your name. Uh, we pray that you would use us to accomplish your purpose. So be with us now as we open your word. We ask, Father, that you would speak, that we would hear, and that we would be submissive uh, to your word and to your will. We ask it all in Jesus' name, and amen. Well, as we come to Psalm 115, uh, it's somewhat of a familiar refrain as we begin. Uh, it probably sounds very, um, I'm sure you've heard it. Uh, in verse 1, it says, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. Right? And so that, that may sound familiar to you, and, and certainly it should. Oftentimes, this is a psalm that comes up at times uh, after great victory, uh, where you see God's hand clearly moving. I remember um, reading the story of Will, William Wilberforce. Uh, you know, he, uh, after the abolishment of the slave trade uh, in England, uh, you know, in, in his long fight there, uh, he just retired to his room, and he meditated on verse 1 of Psalm, psalm 115. <laughs> Lord, it wasn't me, <laughs> it wasn't us, it was you, O oh Lord, who accomplished this. And, and so we see that many times, that in times of victory, uh, we, we hear echoes of this reality. And it's, it's a right heart, right? It's a, to understand that in and of ourselves, we accomplish nothing, that the glory belongs to the Lord. And, and maybe you're here tonight and, and you, you understand that, but maybe maybe... Maybe tonight victory is something that's just out of your grasp, right? And maybe you're here and uh, 
um, you know, victory is not what's on your mind. Maybe you're in the middle of a struggle right now, and, and, and you're not sure of the outcome. You're not sure where this is heading. You're not sure how it's going. And, and the last thing you feel is victorious as we've gathered here this evening. And, and, and I have good news for you. Psalm 115 wasn't written to a people who were experiencing victory, right? This is, this is not a people who were, who, who were having a, you know, easy, rosy time, right? These are people who were struggling and experiencing persecution. Uh, and I can show you from the context, you look at verse 2, and, 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 and we see a, <laughs> some of that, that persecuting voice. Why should the nation say, where is their God? Right? So we have, we have surrounding nations looking at the people of God and saying, Where's your God now? I don't know. You, you ever been in situations or circumstances like that where you've heard, where you've heard words like that? Uh, I know you call yourself a Christian, but <laughs> where's your God at now? What, what, what's he doing now? Uh, how has that helped you in any way? What good is he doing for you in this? And oftentimes we hear that right through when we're experiencing great storms and trials in our life. Uh, for those who love God and want to serve him, there'll be those voices who come in times of sickness, in times of when things, you know, when the wheels just kind of fall apart, when everything seems to be going wrong, nothing is going right. And people will say, where's your God? Where's your God at? I mean, it was clear when the people of Israel were, were leaving Egypt and entering the promised land, it was clear that, man, God was with them. And everybody knew it, right? And, and, and then as they're starving and they're thirsty and suddenly people are beginning to question what where's your god and and, and even even the people of god are, are are starting to go god where are you right and, and so this is a time and in fact when you jump down to verses 9 through 11 you hear you hear a a call, O Israel, trust the Lord. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord, in verse 10. In verse 11, you who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. Right? So there's, a, there's circumstances, a situation in the, in the lives of the people of God at this point where they're, they're having a difficult time trusting their God. This is Jehovah, right? All caps, all L, capital L-O-R-D. This is the covenant God, the one who has made his promise with them. And, and, and yet they're having a difficult time. And we don't know. We don't know the circumstances surrounding this psalm. There's certainly countless times in, in the life of the people of Israel where, where the psalmist could be calling them to trust him. And, and there could be those, those outsiders who are going, oh, where's your God? Remember when Nehemiah and his people are working on the wall and they're just laughing, right? <laughs> Look at that, right? What, 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 what do you think you're trying to accomplish? Yeah, and, and so the people of God are not foreign to that type of mocking and not just mocking them but mocking the god they love and serve and some of you have experienced that firsthand you've been there <laughs> what good is your god doing for you now and so that that is the situation in which we have this great cry of victory there in verse one and and so verse one is not is not the reality verse one is the goal so this beautiful song uh, is is really here's the heart behind as we're going through the storm as we're going through the struggle our heart's desire is what the glory of god right regardless of what you're going through regardless of what you're facing the desire the heart of uh, of his people should be god's glory now that 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 really is the center and heart of what we want to focus on tonight right and we see it there in verse one as we read not to us, not to us, but to your name give glory. So here's the goal, right? The goal for the psalmist and the goal for you and I, if we rightly understand it, is God alone gets the glory. God alone gets the glory. The, the, the psalmist here understands one of the most important truths that anyone can ever grasp, that you and I and everyone else exists primarily for the glory of God. Don't miss that truth. Right? It, 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 we, we preach it, we, we shout it, we proclaim it over and over again. You do not exist for you. You exist for God. You are made by Him and for Him. 
And so now the psalmist is saying what? Not not to me, not to us, not to the people, God, but but God to you, to your name, give glory. In fact, this is God's heart. And, and that's difficult for us to grasp. But God desires his glory above all other things. <laughs> you say that seems very self-centered and self-seeking. But if, if God is glorious and he is the greatest good, then then the best thing he could desire for anyone is that they would they would seek him. Right. And so this is what God wants, because it's ultimately what is best for all of us. Isaiah 42, 8, <laughs> the Lord speaking says, I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Right? We have a picture in the scripture of a jealous God, right? A God who says that the glory belongs to me alone. Now, the desire of the psalmist here is right. It's a right desire, right? Not to me, not to us, but to you alone, O Lord, belong the glory. But here's the problem, right? That's not our default desire, is it? Is, is your default desire the glory of God? Not, not, not often, is it? <laughs> we are, I call it glory chasers, <laughs> right? We, we, we love glory, not, not the glory of, we love when we get the glory, right? That's what, we, that's what we like, that's what we crave, and when we get it, we relish in that. And so here the psalmist is saying, no, the glory doesn't belong to me. It belongs to you, Lord. That's hard, isn't it? There's, there's something within us that craves that, that desires that. Right? And, and that's true of each one of us, regardless of where you're at you know, and what you do. When, when praise comes your way, when somebody exalts you, <laughs> it's very easy to let that just sink right into our head, right? Oh, I am pretty good. I am really great, right? And we, we, we crave that and we want that, but it's not ours. It doesn't belong to us. And the psalmist understands that, right? This desire is a right desire that God alone gets the glory. And you might stop here tonight and you say, why, why does he get all the glory? Why, why does it belong to him? Well, the psalmist goes on and explains. Notice verse 2. I'm sorry, the second stanza of verse 1. For... For the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Why? Why do you get the glory? God alone gets the glory because of his unstoppable love and his faithfulness. Right? We saw that pictured last Wednesday in Psalm 107. <laughs> you remember verse 1 and 2? Give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so whom he has redeemed from trouble. So we saw those pictures of God's redemption, right? His salvation, his love towards his people. And here the psalmist says God gets the glory because of his love, his redemptive love. If there's any area where people seek and strive to rob God of glory, it's the area of salvation, is it not? When you talk to someone about, you know, is your relationship right with God? Are you on your way to heaven? If you were to die today... You know, would God let you into heaven? Most people are going to say, yeah. And if you ask him why, you know what you're going to hear? Because I'm a pretty good person. I'm a pretty good, right? And so we, we tend to kind of judge. We, 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 we evaluate ourselves on a scale, <laughs> right? And, and, well, I'm better than so-and-so. You know, I may not be as good as, as them, but, you know, and, and so surely, you know, a good God's going to let me into heaven because I'm a, I'm a pretty good person. And we like to rob God of the glory that is due him alone. Because if we understand the scripture rightly, there's none good, no, not one. There's not a single one of us sitting here tonight or anyone who deserves the grace of God. We don't deserve salvation, but God has provided it fully in such a way that he alone gets the glory. That's why we say, right, salvation is all of God. <laughs> we... we we believe, we trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ, that he did it all. He did it all. So we cannot rob God of the glory that is his alone in his salvation. And here the psalmist says, your steadfast love, your faithfulness, because of that, you get the glory, Lord. Right? And, and he doesn't stop there. 
Here the nations are saying what? Where is your God? Well, the psalmist has the answer. Look at verse 3. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Where is your God at? What good is he doing? Oh, he's in the heavens. You know, God alone gets the glory because he is above all things. We have a transcendent God who is bigger than we can imagine or think, right? Our, think, of, think of that Lord's Prayer, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We have a great God who is, he's in the heavens. <laughs> he, he is above, he is over all things. Not only is he over all things, but notice he does all that he pleases. Do you, un- do you understand that there is, there is nothing that God desires, that he does not accomplish. He does all that he pleases. God is sovereign over all things. So as we get this picture of a, of a loving, glorious, sovereign God, then we can say, what? Well, yes, he is worthy. He's worthy of our worship. He's worthy of our praise. He's worthy of all he alone gets that. Now, what about these people who are mocking God and, and laughing at his people and questioning his presence and his power? Well, notice the, the, the psalmist has a response to these, these mockers, these, these laughing, you know, and, and he says in verse 4, their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. Right? The psalmist says, my God is in the heavens, right? He is the one true God. Your your idols, <laughs> your idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. Right? So to, to those who are questioning, is this not, is this not the height of foolishness? I mean, I, I don't. I'm not. If you want to, if you want to see a a, a a a clear picture, go to Isaiah 44. In Isaiah 44, verses 9 through 20, God himself speaks of how foolish it is that a man goes out and chops down a tree, takes part of it and warms himself with the fire, and takes another part and, and sticks an idol up in his home. <laughs> same, same wood, warming himself, cooking his food on one of it, and then on the next part, he's got an idol that he's bowing down before. Is that not foolish? And, and, and it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter how costly the substance, how precious the metal is still what? It's lifeless. It's lifeless. Jehovah God is alive, right? These idols are not creators, but they are creations. <laughs> you know, we, we have a God who made all things, but these idols are, are made. And so the, the response back to those laughing, where is your God, is to say, look at your worthless idols. Your silver and your gold that you bow down, that you worship. You know, this is what Paul wrote about in Romans chapter 1. In verse 22, he said, Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. This is what, this is what men do, right? They replace God with something safe, with something tangible that they can touch, that they can see. But it's foolishness. It's foolishness. And God offers a strong warning in Romans chapter 1 for those who have exchanged the glory of God for these worthless idols. And notice notice how the psalmist describes them in verse 5. They have mouths, but do not speak. These these man-made idols, they, they cannot speak. They make no promises. They're incapable of giving commands or offering consolation. Oh, but we have a God who spoke the world into existence. He said, let there be light. And there was light. We have a God whose word accomplishes his purpose. Do we not? Isaiah 55, 11 says, so shall my word be that comes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but shall accomplish that which I purpose. Right? We have a God who, who speaks. In fact, that's what we are looking at tonight, right? The very Word of God as he's spoken and he's revealed himself to us. These worthless idols, they do not speak, do not offer any commands, do not offer any comfort. 
They have eyes, but they do not see. How foolish to bow down before silver and gold and wood. And they, they are utterly unaware of the needs of the people before them. They're unable to perceive what? Any impending threat. They're blind to everything around them. But we have a God who sees. We have a God who sees. Second Corinthians or Second Chronicles 16, 9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward him. He sees. He sees it all. <laughs> you know, the, the Psalm 139 says, where can I hide from your presence? <laughs> you know, nowhere, right? He, he, it, it's, all, it's all visible to him. They have ears, but do not hear. <laughs> it doesn't matter how fervent or how passionate or how loud their cries are. They don't hear. Isn't it? If your if your mind doesn't kind of run to First Kings eighteen and and, and and Elijah and the prophets of Baal, that's immediately what I think of when I think they have ears and they do not hear. And those prophets of Baal are right, Elijah says, "Go for it, right? Appeal to Baal, appeal to your God, and see what." And, and those prophets, four hundred of them, screaming and yelling and cutting themselves and and, and pleading with Baal to act. <laughs> and finally, remember what Elijah does after after silence for for hours. Elijah mocks them and says, cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he's musing or he's relieving himself or he's on a journey. Perhaps he's asleep and must be awakened. <laughs> right? He just, how foolish to cry out to this non-God. <laughs> they have ears, oh, but they do not hear. Noses, but do not smell. Remember after Noah, uh, after the flood, Noah bur- a burnt offering to the Lord. And it said it was a fragrant offering fragrant smell to the Lord. And he made a promise after that that he would not again curse the ground because of man. They have hands, but do not feel. You know, these worthless idols, these man-made gods, they lack the capacity to touch, to feel, to embrace, to, to come to, to help in any way. Oh, this is not the God that we worship, is it? Jehovah is the one who extends his hand to deliver. Psalm 73, uh, verse 23 says, Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by my, by your right hand. Right? That God holds his people. And yet, if we extend that idea a, a little further, not just a God who, yes, he holds us, but a God who came, a God who took his hands and healed the leper, a, a, a God who allowed his hands to be pierced so that we might be saved. Not a, not a God who, they have hands, they do not feel, feet, but do not walk. They do not make a sound in their throat, right? They, they, this is not a God who can come to the rescue, but we have a God, right, who came. Who came. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And Jesus came to rescue and to save us. You know, they... These gods that they worshipped, they had to mount, they had to tie up so they would not tip over, so they would not fall over. And they're immovable, immobile. If they, if they wanted to take them somewhere, they had to pick them up and carry them somewhere. I, I think of that picture in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 5 when the, <laughs> when the Philistines captured uh, the, the, the Ark of the Covenant and they put it in their temple of Dagon. It just, it's a humorous picture, it really is. Because they put the Ark of the Covenant in their temple, and the, the, the statue of Dagon is, fell, is falling over on its face in front of the Ark of the Covenant. And they walk in, they're like, oh, we can't have that. So they pick it up, and they tie it back up. And the next day, it's fell over again, and the arms <laughs> are cut off. Right? <laughs> and, and so there's nothing. It's just a, just a limb that's all that's left. There's a, a, a clear distinction between the true, the one true God and worthless idols. <laughs> Notice verse 8. It says, Those who make them become like them, so do all who trust in them. And it, it's just a picture, right? We, 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 we say these are worthless idols, but those who worship them, they, they find emptiness. They find nothing. 1 Corinthians 8, 4 says, We know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but There's only one God, the God of the Bible, the God who created 
all things, who sustains all things. And anything else is worthless. It's empty. You know, idols promise much, but they never deliver on their promises. They always leave us feeling empty. And, 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 and the reality is, is, ultimately, they'll just suck the life out of you. You know, that you, and, and I, I know, I know we're, we live in a, in a world where we're not, we don't see men bowing before silver and gold and wooden statues. But we certainly see idolatry, do we not? Now, I, I, that's not to say it doesn't happen. Uh, when, when I worked for Terminax and I'd go into homes, I would see, I would see, <laughs> I would see idols in, in the homes of people who, who that they worship. It is, it's really a little, it's a little eerie. <laughs> right, when, when you walk into someone's bedroom and you see a, a, a little temple, <laughs> And, and, and that happens, even here in this area. But we certainly see people chasing after idols. And, and, and not, yeah, not statues, but anything, right? Anything that takes the place of God in our heart is an idol. And, you know, John Calvin said our hearts are idol-making factories. Yeah, there's a, we're, we sing that song, right? <laughs> Come thou fount, prone to wander. <laughs> Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. We, we have this danger continually before us to, to chase after, to run after something else that promises to do what only God can do. And it will leave us feeling empty. And uh, you know, I'm going to ask just, you know, I, always, I have some idle identifying questions that I ask myself uh, periodically, and, and, and they're helpful. So I want to ask those to you without trying to elaborate too much just for time's sake but uh, how do i identify idols that aren't made of wood and stone in my life how do i recognize those and so some questions you might ask number one what are you most afraid of what are you most afraid of right i don't want this i can't have this right um secondly what do you long for most passionately what gets you out of bed in the morning you know what what causes you to care to try to strive um where do you run for comfort when things go wrong? When things, when things are bad and you're stressed out, where do you run? Yeah, you know, we think of that old <laughs> spiritual, right? Where can I go but to the Lord? But people run. They run, all, right? They run to alcohol and drugs and, and sex. And, and, and we, we see continu- people running in different directions, right? Those are idols. When, whatever you run to is a good indicator of what your God is. What causes you to be angry at God? God, how dare you let this happen? How dare you take this from me? Right? And we could just, you know, whether that be a, uh, someone we love, right, or, or something we love. And, and how could you let that happen? How could you take that away? And what you're really saying is what? God, how could you take my idol from me? The thing that I rely on, the thing that I depend upon. <laughs> what is it? that you make the biggest sacrifices for, that you spend your time, your money, your energy on? Right? What, what's on your mind uh, when you can't sleep? What do you think about when you get up in the morning? Right? Those are indicators of what, what may be your God. Um, we're going to move past that just for time's sake. But they're good questions to ask because they begin to reveal our heart. Because when we're in trouble, we should run to Him, Right? We should seek our, our acceptance and our approval in Him. We should fear Him above all things. But what we see is that when we see the, they're trusting in these worthless idols and it's empty, but here, again, that call, O Israel, trust in the Lord. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. Let all who fear the Lord trust in the Lord. Why? He is their help and their shield. So, so, when we trust him, he gets the glory. When we trust God in the midst of our struggle, God is the one who is glorified. And he is where we find our help, right? God gets the glory because he's our provider and protector. He's our help and our shield. Don't you love that picture? The, the one, where can we run to? Where, we, where, where can we find help? It's in him alone. He's the one who provides safety, security, protection. You know, a mighty fortress is our God. <laughs> a, a stronghold never failing. Right? He's the one who 
so we can run to in our time of need. And then in verses 12 to 15, the Lord has remembered us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, both the small and the great. May the Lord give you increase, you and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord who made heaven and earth. And we see that God alone gets the glory because he's the source of all blessing. Any blessing that comes, comes from him. And so the psalmist here, in the midst of struggle, is praying, may the Lord bless you. That's what we do tonight, right? As we gather together to pray, we seek the Lord. We seek his face, knowing that any help, any comfort, any strength, any blessing comes from him. And there's a last, this, this last refrain in verses 16 to 18 is an important reminder, right? If we exist for the glory of God, and God alone is meant to get the glory, then what we see here is the heavens are the Lord's heavens, but the earth he has given to the children of man. So he has placed man upon the earth. Why? For his glory, right? Where his image bears. <laughs> we, were, we were given dominion over the earth that God would be glorified. And then he says, the dead do not praise the Lord, nor do any go down into silence. But we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord. So we exist on this earth to bring him glory. But we have a finite amount of time to do that. Now, again, he's not talking about those who have gone on to be with the Lord in eternity. We know that, right, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And, and we have the privilege of worshiping him forever and ever. But we have a limited amount of time on this earth to bring him glory. Do you see that? The, the dead do not praise the Lord. So he's given this earth to the children of man. To, to, to honor him, to glorify him, to praise him. And you and I have a small amount of time to do that. Every day that you have is a gift from God. And we need to use it with all of our might and all of our strength to glorify him. Where you work, as you live, in your home, in your church, in your community, with every fiber of your being, we say what? Bless the Lord, praise the Lord from this time forth forevermore. <laughs> yes, he is worthy to be praised now and for all eternity. And that's what we have to look forward to, to enjoy the glorious presence of our Lord and Savior. He alone is worthy to be praised.